Okay, so uh, I guess we're going to continue on. I mean, last time we got almost finished the, the stability stuff, basically. There was just one thing at the end, and I got kind of bogged down in some matrix algebra. Okay, but I went through it, and actually, it kind of, it, it works out. It's not, it's not really fun, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go through it in, in tremendous detail, but and actually, I realized that there's kind of no point to the matrix algebra I did at the end, too, Okay because, um, let's just pop over to the, the iPad here. So, and let's, what's going on? All right, come on lag. All right, okay, so it's, it's not the worst lag. All right, so, um, yeah, this is all that matrix algebra at the bottom, but um, yeah, so, some of it is necessary, some of it is not, let me see. Um, but let me let me give you the the basic recap though was if we if we go back up top okay was geez that's it, it it's it's just more complicated than I expect but but essentially we solve the eigen system right and we get these eigen values here that's important right then we the second part of solving the eigen system is getting the eigen vectors that we do here and the only thing to remember there is that there's an indeterminacy which is that the eigen vectors can be scaled up and down arbitrarily. So really all we, we solve for is the ratio, in this case of, of one to two, because there's only two components. Okay, so that's enough to, to get the, the characterize what we care about. Okay, and so since the ratio is lambda i, for eigenvector i, the ratio is lambda i over q, or minus lambda i over q, um, we could do minus lambda i over q and one, or we could do lambda i and minus q, which is conveniently satisfies that ratio. Okay, so this seems like the clear, sort of the natural choice to save us on uh, at least algebra or virtual ink. Okay, so you do that. And so once we, this is like for, for eigenvalue lambda i, then this is the corresponding eigenvector. So there's two of those. And so we can construct our eigenvalue, eigenvector matrix, which remember the eigenvectors here in this case are column vectors. And so we stack them horizontally into a matrix. Okay, so that gives us our V, which, is, which was important because that's our transformation. That gets us from deviations from steady state space into, or Vinvish does, gets us into the sort of rotated diagonalized space, okay? Um, then we, do, we, we employ that logic, which is that uh, the, the, man, the stable manifold, right, it, it's gonna, the shape of the, the dimensionality of the stable manifold is gonna depend on the signs of the eigenvalues. If the eigenvalue is positive, that's an unstable uh, component all right, um, and that, that has to be zero if we want to maintain stability. Uh, and then if it's negative, we can we can set it in principle however we want, and it'll still converge. Okay, so that stable manifold, we found basically we, we, we had lambda plus and lambda minus. Okay, so the first one we're calling the plus one, which is unstable. We're going to say that has to be zero. And so that's why we have we, our x hat should look like a zero and then something, which I'm just calling z. So that's like an initial point in the space, supposing we want it to converge to steady state, which we do, uh, should have should have the, the form zero comma z or zero and z on the bottom. All right, so um, that, uh, but then remember that's in eigen space or whatever, okay, rotated reshaped space, okay? Um, and, and also remember that the, the one and two here don't correspond to k tilde and c tilde. There's a linear mapping between them, but they don't, it's not zero corresponds to K and Z corresponds to Z. It's just a mapping. Okay. So, but if we want to find, we want to invert now, we want to back, go back from eigenspace into real, you know, deviations from steady state space, right? So that's our X tilde, which is K tilde and C tilde. It's just going to be V times X because V inverse is how we get to eigenspace and V is how we get out of eigenspace. All right. So we just, um, multiply these two together, okay? Um, and then when you do that, okay, so you have Vx, I'm plugging in for V, that's just X and we know it's zero Z. You do the multiplication and you, you, you basically pick up that second column, right? Because the first one is zero. Uh, so, so really it's just that first eigenvector times Z in this case, or sorry, the second eigenvector, the stable one times Z, okay? So that's gonna pick up lambda two, all right? Now, um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. Now, then what I did, <clears throat> right? And you can see in this picture, it's sort of like you know, we're, if you think about the the general problem we had, where we where we drew the real uh, 
uh, K and C space, and then we sort of looked at deviations around that, and then we sort of linearized it. That's what we're doing here, okay? So here, go, here I mean, we basically have everything we need, okay? So, so you know, a Z, Z, that Z there is indexing this line. This is the stable arm here, okay? Um, you know, in the stable arm, like in the, in the full generality, right, the stable arm is, is, is a whole thing, right? And then we're looking around state space. So the Z locally is, is indexing this stable line here, okay? And then that the, the slope is like lambda two over, or minus lambda two over Q, right? Or, or my, sorry, it's minus Q over lambda two, that's slope, because as you move Z, you know, K changes and C changes, but the ratio since C is in the vertical dimension, the ratio is minus Q over lambda two. So that's that slope, okay? So so from here, actually, um, uh, that, that's basically all, all we need. And so then what, what I did next, which which proved to be more complicated than, than I wanted was, it's still right in some sense, although I made a few algebraic errors too on top of that. But, but, but the idea is that, okay, well, that's deviations from say, say you can find for a given actual K zero, you can find what's the corresponding z, and then sort of map that back into what's the c. Okay, but but really you can just intuit it in some sense and say, okay, well, you know, k tilde of zero is just our initial condition that's given to us k zero. Okay, which means that uh, z should be k zero over lambda two. Right, z should be k zero over lambda two from from that first the top side of uh, this equation. Okay, um, you know, so k tilde is sorry. I should write z of zero. So z, I guess I'm I'm letting be a function too. So like z of zero, k tilde zero over lambda two. All right, which is you know so that's the number k zero over lambda two. Um, and then we can plug that in here to get C tilde. So C tilde of zero is uh, uh, minus Q times Z of zero. So it's minus Q over lambda two times K zero. Okay. So the initial condition basically gives you that slope back. I mean, you have K zero is K zero and then because that the slope is minus q over lambda two, that that c zero is going to be minus q over lambda two times that k zero. All right. So, and this is not just true actually at zero. It's it's true at any time because you know it, everything's proportional to z. Z is decaying right at rate lambda two, but there, that proportion always holds. Okay. And you can just you know take this equation, these two equations here, and divide them. K tilde over c tilde is equal to or c tilde over k tilde is equal to minus q over lambda two because the z's cancel. That's true anywhere. I'm now I'm in particular, it's in, in particular it's true at zero, then it continues to be true. Okay, so um, so that's pretty much it. You 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 have some initial k zero, initial conditions given to you. C zero, you're gonna choose according to that ratio, right? So make sure it makes it shows you're on the stable arm. Since it's a linear system, that ratio is just constant, essentially. Okay. Uh, and then Z that the the D you know you 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 start somewhere on this line. And then you just move on that line towards steady state, okay, in the linear world, right? Which is an approximation to the nonlinear world. Okay, so that's that's really it. You can go through and do v and v inverse, and, and actually things kind of cancel, and it gets it simplified. I'm not sure. I, I, Garrett mentioned you mentioned there's there's probably some results out there about you know, simplifying this in a general sense. Um, I couldn't really find that much, but I'd imagine there's something. But but in this case, if you just work, you know, churn through the algebra by hand, things do cancel, and you just sort of recover what you get at the end. And in some sense, it's 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 inevitable. I mean, you have to if you do that substitution, you're going to get this answer that we intuited here, right? So um, yeah, so it, I I think I, I did I, I overcomplicated things at the end of the last lecture. I think is is the thing. So um, I I tend to do that. I tend to to the last five minutes of the lecture just ignore what I say basically. Right, so uh, I, 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 for some reason, you know, you think I could just go a full whatever hour, whatever, whatever. I feel like the lecture is getting shorter these days. Hour fifteen. Yeah. So um, you think I could just do that, and then 
at five minutes after that, I could just spout nonsense while I turned off the, the Zoom. But it just like happens, some endogenous process, my brain shuts off five minutes early. So what can you do? Um, all right, so uh, so that's I think that's stability. I mean, you can you can we can fiddle around with that more, you know, uh, if we want. But but that's that's the core of it. Okay, um, that's uh, and so you can do that for any system. I mean, um, most of the time you're just going to look at the eigenvalues and get the sort of qualitative shape. You don't have to go through and say this is the slope of the stable arm and everything like that. Although you can, right? So. Um, but but most of the time it's going to suffice just to find the eigenvalues and, and say is it is it a bull, is it a is it a peak I guess uh, or is it the saddle right so those are the three basic options okay um, although there are other more exotic options it's just yeah so let me think um, oh yeah because we imaginary numbers they'll get you so. Uh, the eigenvalues could be imaginary in principle, right? So um, there, that that's when you get cycles, right? Because you think, okay, well, I said there's there's a bull, there's there's a peak, and there's a saddle, but that assumes you're converging the steady state. Uh, it might be that you you orbit around steady state, okay? Clearly, orbits are things. Planets orbit around stuff, okay? That, that's that's a system. Um, so that could be a thing, and that that's going to come out when I think. Yeah, I think it's. When you have complex eigenvalues, that that arises. Okay, so we're not going to do that so much um, here. Uh, yeah, so so this is a two D system. So you know you kind of need to a two D system to get orbits. With the one D system, you you um, with the one D system, you can uh, you basically are going to diverge, converge, or be constant. All right. Um, with a 2D system, you can you can you can do orbits and and you know so uh, if you think about um, so so a 2D system it does like uh, if you think about something with momentum basically that's a second dimension which is you're you're moving you're you're moving in a space it could be an oscillator a spring it could be a stock price or something but um, if it has momentum it's not another stock price it's it's just there's some notion of momentum okay it's it's moving fast. You read it. Uh, Wall Street bets getting excited. People are throwing in money, and it just keeps going, right? So that's the thing. Of course, that's not always how it works out. Um, but but you could imagine something like that. There's a background process that's providing momentum. Okay, so um, that with that, you can in principle <clears throat> get oscillations. It's just that it's very in practice in economics rare to to really get that. Oftentimes, it's sort of precluded by stuff like consumption smoothing and, and optimality, Nash equilibria, and all that. It's there. Usually, those kind of things need some some kind of uh, myopia or, or so, some deviation from perfect, what we would call perfect rationality, to, to get that kind of stuff, um, which is fine. If you want to do that, uh, but it, you need it, it gets complicated basically. So, uh, in macro, we're, we're probably not going to get into that so much. I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you if you want to go to a, since this is a macro class, so I should I should comment on it. I mean, if you if you want to think about a macro level moment, notion of momentum, I mean, people generally think about business cycles as more IID processes. Um, I mean, obviously, a recession is a big event and it's long term and it doesn't just disappear overnight, right? Um, but the notion of of true oscillations, uh, in the sense that you know, if if you have a really good um, economic growth that you're sort of due for a recession that doesn't seem to be you know supported by the data or anything like that and it doesn't really come out of the models that we entertain right so um let's say it can't happen i mean if you have a so if you think about like sort of the, the, the classical example like the roaring 20s followed by the depression you know if you have a, a period of really sort of exuberant growth people's balance sheets get a little sloppy you know um start getting out too much money, maybe there is a sense in which a financial recession could be sort of due. Uh, so I don't want to, to downplay that too much, but it, but but at least in the modern, more in the modern era, less so. But, you know, 2008 was a recent financial recession, so or like a, a recession with sort of clear financial origins. And so, um, you know, which was sort of 
caused by the housing boom in a lot of ways. So, so maybe there's some some truth to that too, right? So, uh, you can you can accommodate anything you want basically with this stuff. It's just generally we don't see these types of oscillations. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, we can, we're going to move on. All right. Uh, but keep that in your back pocket. Right. It can be useful sometimes. Um, now there's kind of there's some odds and ends I think that I need to we need to, to, to work on. So some of them, I mean, you've probably already more or less figured out. I mean, it, it, just going through homework and stuff. So, uh, and, it, and it's not, um, gen, it's not genuinely like, genuinely new stuff. It's just sort of like, you know, methods and tricks and uh, and things like that. So, um, the one thing I did want to go through is was thinking about Ramsey and thinking about long term growth in a in a Ramsey type setting. Okay. Um, because, well, I mean, we, we basically, did we do Ramsey with, I, I think we, we might've, we, we, we kind of touched upon Ramsey with long-term growth a bit, but I don't know that we went through it in great detail. Um, it exists probably on some page pre prior to this, uh. But but I think that there's a few things that I kind of want to talk about and and so you know but but I think a lot of it is sort of intuitive, um, but this is just sort of like how to approach a settings with long term growth. Okay, so um, yeah, so okay, here's what I'll say: when we did Ramsey, um, we were yeah, I mean we were basically using a, a, a sort of a static production function f of k, right? Um, when we went through it, so so there's sort of an implicit, not much, not much else is moving over time. All all of the stuff we did though, you could just throw in a, a you know, f of a comma k. Right? You could say all this, also there was some technology, right? Um, and a lot of what we did basically goes through. Okay, so the um, the Hamiltonian optimization stuff, if things are growing systematically over time, that's generally fine. Okay, there's some technical limitations. With regards to is like time varying interest rates, um, and even those are driven mostly just by proving the theorem more than like it doesn't actually work. I mean, usually it kind of still works. Okay, it's just like which which version of this Hamiltonian optimization theorem did we go with? All right, so um, there are ways to break it, but it's it's tough. Okay, so um, yeah, as long as your utility function like exists and and the integral computes, then usually you're okay. Um, okay, so so but so that, so that, so you can just sort of like go through and just add in you know a's wherever you want where you have growth and make sure that you're tracking growth rates appropriately and everything like that, um, and things generally work. Okay, so uh, but if you look at um, okay, we've not, we have a we have a situation here where my like my iPad just doesn't work at all. Okay, no, that's the wrong class. Let's try this again. I think it crashed. I think I crashed it. It didn't like. It didn't like it. I get values. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Oh, good. There we go. All right. So let's let's start a new section here. So, okay. So let, I'm gonna go back and kind of just just do that process of adding in um, for for sort of long term growth uh, or like long term technological growth. I'm not gonna write the word technological. Because you know, you guys would need to be able to read it in my handwriting the way it is. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, what do we have? So we're just gonna sort of invoke what we found before. So the Euler equation, remember what we found a while ago, looked like this. R minus rho. Okay, so that's that's what we get for the Euler equation when we derive our Hamiltonian optima, uh, optimality conditions kill off that mu and you get uh, a law of motion for C, or just basically you look at how does the interest rate compare to, to your discount rate, um, throw in a factor of whatever your uh, elasticity of marginal utility is, I guess, um, and then grow accordingly, grow your consumption according to that. So, um, all right, so now here, you know, if you, if you want to think about, uh, you know, uh, when we found the steady state generally, right, we would um, 
set C dot to zero and say, okay, now we're gonna we're, we're gonna be in steady state. And that was for our phase diagrams, right? That's how we how we how we did things. In general, I mean, we could just call this GC, right? So maybe with technological growth, C is going to be growing over time. C over L, your per capita consumption. That's the whole idea, right? Is that things get better. Um, so in general, it's going to look like this. Um, let's let's do CRRA, okay? You can just imagine. I just don't feel like writing epsilons and I mean, it's just a, you could swap it back in at any time if you want to, right? So well, let's for now just kind of pretend like we're in CRRA land. Okay, so this says that GC is R minus rho over theta, okay? Now, um, yeah, that's, that's just, if, if you have uh, a C that's growing over time, then that's, that's where you're going to get. And then um, oftentimes people write, I don't know why people, people like to say this is in terms of R being equal to something. Uh, so if you just solve for R, it's going to say that R is equal to rho plus theta GC. I don't know, at least you don't have a fraction then, um, or I guess people think about it as, and I, I, you know, we went over this last time a little bit of, well, th this is actually something that you can, you can look at in the data, right? Um, it's a relatively simple equation consisting only of things that are, are relatively easy to measure in the data. Okay, so um, yeah, and, it, and it, it doesn't really work out that well. I was looking at at some point. I um, well, we'll we'll actually be we'll be working with data in a bit, so we can look at it. But if you if you plot, if you do a scatter plot of GC versus R, that's so good. Uh, but this, yeah, I, I kind of talked about the reasons for that a couple of lectures ago. So, you know, there's other things that are changing and they're, they're correlated with both GC and R. So it's not clear that you would, uh, the, 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 this theory isn't dead yet. Okay. Um, basically. All right. So, so that, okay. So if you have general GC, you know, we have technology. If you have technology growing of, of the, uh, uh, labor augmenting form, let's say, um, then you're going to continue growth in consumption per capita, right? And so that GC is going to be positive, all right? Now, we know um, in the long run, okay, that that GC is going to be growing at the same rate as, as A, right? That's basically Uzawa's theorem, right? Is that you can, um, you know, well, it, it's integral to is I was saying in the sense that, you know, if, if you just do the growth accounting stuff, um, you know, with, with technological growth, if you, if you work out those growth rates with the production function and the investment equation and everything, which, which still hold, right? So the investment equation and the production function, they're still operating in the background because they're sort of like physical rules about of the system. Okay. The only, the new thing is, is that savings is endogenized according, sort of according to this uh, optimization, essentially the Euler equation. So, um, Savings and consumption, that is. So, um, yeah, so, but if you work out those, then you're gonna get, you know, like that, that basically that GC is gonna be equal to G in the long run, which, which is like, and G is what we're calling GA, okay? That technological growth rate. But, but if I just write G, it's, you can assume it's, it's GA, okay? So, um, yeah, so then, you know, if you, if, if you want to sub it in here, if that's going to give you, in, in the long run, in steady state, I guess, really, this is saying that R is going to be equal to rho plus theta G. Okay. Um, all right. And then uh, we know that R um, is going to, so R will be equal to F prime of K minus delta still. All right. So that's... Um, I don't think I've gone through the factor price stuff with um, with technological growth yet, but basically, R you're going to get R it, even with technological growth, R is going to be um, a prime of k, all right? So, um, well, it's going to yeah, it's going to be a prime of k appropriately, k tilde really, okay? So you can. Um, now this this might this I might have actually not gone through and that maybe I should touch upon this. Let me um, let me just see what I have in the, the lecture slides. So so just and this is partially just sort of the terminology that we're gonna, we may need to use at some point. Um, you know so in general right we're going to define k as you know 
okay, this big K over L, right? Um, and then you know, sometimes we're, we need to sort of talk about both per capita and a, another normalization by A, right? So then we would write K tilde as K over AL. Okay, we got some lag here. Um, yeah, so K tilde is, is K over AL, right? So, um, okay, so then if you want, if you want to think about, you know, and, and then what, like, you know, Y is Y over L, Y tilde is, as you would expect, Y over AL, okay? So, so we're going to define these tilde variables, which are normalized also by A, okay? So, I, I mean, we did that in, in solo a while ago, right? So, and then, you know, if you think about your, your production function, and remember, we're going to stick with labor augmenting, okay? If you just divide by AL, then you're going to get kind of a nice little canceling because we assumed it was all labor augmenting. You're going to get Y over AL being equal to K to the alpha over AL to the alpha, which is K over AL to the alpha. And so you, you just recover a, a tilde ified version of of our original production function. That, that So I did that in, in Cobb Douglas. Um, in general, if it's, you can do the same thing with homo a homogeneous of degree one uh, production function. You can, you can, you can do this, you, you essentially you can divide through and you'll get the same result, right? So, um, okay. And then, but then the, for, for thinking about factor prices, okay. All right. So factor prices here, factor prices being that's that says prices okay um, so here the idea is uh, th so these are R and R and W right so the factors are capital and labor the prices are R and W okay so um, yeah so here it's just you, you want to be careful about getting the factor prices in a setting with uh, technological growth because the wage you would expect the wage you would hope the wage grows over time with technology right um, and it's a little, it's, it's funny because the wage grows, but then the interest rate ends up not growing. Just one of those things. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, you know, R is going to be F, sorry. You need to do, remember there's capital R. So R is going to be F sub K. All right. The, the lag is, it's back. What's the deal with that? Okay, well, if it keeps doing that, I might restart the the iPad, but we'll see. Okay, so R is going to be F sub K, right, of K over AL, all right? Um, yeah, I might, I might restart this in a second. Uh, it's not cooperating. All right, so I'm going to switch to this give me one second here all right let's try this again figured it out. Okay, now it's just refusing to connect. Give me a second here. Um, <clears throat> all right, so once we do this, we're going to be able to derive some factor prices. So this, I think, should work better. Um, it seems to be, yeah, pretty good for now. All right, so, uh, okay, so, yeah, so I, I, this is a little confusing because I derived the, this y tilde equation here um, for uh, 
the specific case of Cobb Douglas, but now I'm doing it for the general case. So let's let's you know if, if you want to think about it in the general case, this is this is a general production function, and here here it's labor augmenting because we put the AL inside the homogeneous function, um, and so then y over AL is going to be f of uh, k over AL, comma one, <clears throat> right? And then we're still defining little f as capital F of k comma one of whatever that k is, all right? And so this is going to say that y tilde is f of k tilde comma one, which is sort of by construction um, f of k tilde. And actually, we you know, before I think we wrote f tilde, but actually this is the same sort of construction as before, right? So there's, there's no. Uh, once once you impose labor augmenting, it, it's actually literally the same mapping into that little f, okay, which is you know, Cobb Douglas, it's just k to the alpha, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, so that's this, this, yeah, this step here is where we're invoking homogeneity, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's, all right, so that that's the general case, right? Um, and if we, if we if we go back over to the left here, capital R is f sub k, k over al. Now, here, again, we're invoking homogeneity because f, capital F, without the k is homogeneous degree one. It's partial f sub k is homogeneous degree zero. So we can um, <clears throat> divide inside with complete abandon. Uh, in this case, we're going to divide by al. Uh, and then we get that, and it's going to be equal, right? Um, and then if, I mean, if you just look at over on the right here, this definition, right, it, taking a derivative of that with respect to k tilde, for instance, that that's so that's a this this the right hand equality on the right hand side there is just the definition of our little f of k, right? So if you want to even ignore the fact that its argument is, you know, uh, capital, the the mathematical definition is just this, right? I guess it's really like triple equals, right? So, and we can take a derivative of that, right? And so that means that f prime of x is equal to, sorry, I'm running the room here, uh, you know, f1, x1. Okay, yep, okay. My, it's weird, because what I can see is like a little bit of extra room on the bottom, but you guys can't see that, I think. I believe so. So this is gonna be f1, x1. All right, that should be visible. Okay, so it's just, you take a derivative, and that's gonna be <clears throat> uh, f prime. So here, this is, um, you know, uh, R is equal to, so it's FK, K tilde one. So plugging in for K tilde and then noting that this is in fact F prime of K tilde. Okay, so that's where we get, you know, we, we invoke homogeneity, we sub in for our normal, or your like fully normalized variables, tilde variables. And then we also note that F sub K is actually a little F prime. Okay, so in the case of, um, yeah, in the case of the interest rate, it it's it doesn't change you know, as, as long as we're in tilde space okay as long as we're, we're normalized by a also then it, it's the same basic equation okay and so that means um, right and so then r is r minus delta I think let me think yeah uh, so r okay, little lowercase r is r minus delta okay so we can get that so, so then that means this is f prime of k tilde Minus delta. Okay, so that's that's what R is, and we can plug that in back up here. Okay, and that'll give us an equation characterizing the steady state level of capital, right? So the the Euler equation in the steady state, given that we know that G C is going to grow at rate G, that tells us what the interest rate is. If we know the interest rate from this bottom equation here, um, we can uh, invert that to find capital. Okay, so you know, why not? Why don't you just do it? Okay, so we're gonna have is you know bro plus theta g is equal to r, which is also equal to f prime of k minus delta. Okay, um, and so that means you know f prime of k star I guess uh, is equal to rho plus delta plus theta g. Okay, so that's um, yeah. So that's uh, and we so we invert f prime. That'll give us our uh, capital level. Okay, so we can still do it. Everything works. You can see, you know, if, if g is zero, we just get back what we originally had. That that f prime of k star is is rho plus delta. Okay, that's good. Um, and then uh, the other thing is interesting. 
mildly interesting, I would say, is that the utility function, or the sort of the Bernoulli component of the utility function, um, in which this case would, would be characterized by theta, right? So the characteristics of the, the utility function are, are embedded in theta. Uh, that affects the steady state level of capital. Whereas before, it doesn't matter what your utility function is. We did that stuff generally, and you still got um, this level of capital regardless of that. Now with growth, they sort of shape the, the curvature of the utility function, in this case, theta is gonna influence the capital level too, okay? So it, it's still true that, I mean, rho is part of your utility, right? That's how you discount the future. So utility in general still kind of affects it, but like the sort of the exact shape before did not influence capital levels, okay? But now it does because you're kind of moving continually through capital space, right? If, you, if you're converging to a specific point, kind of makes sense that it doesn't matter what the shape of your utility function is because you just kind of end up there. If you're, if you're moving through capital space because of continual growth, everything's growing, then the curvature of utility, so as you get richer, how does your marginal utility fall, right? That's what theta tells you. Your marginal utility is C to the minus theta. Okay, so it says, how fast does your marginal utility fall as you get more and more wealthy, right? You know, in principle, it could be that at some point you're like, well, I'm done, I'm rich enough. Uh, that's it, marginal utility is zero from here on out, okay? Um, in that case, things would be very different, I would suspect. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, things would kind of break down, especially if you have long-run growth, because uh, people would have much less incentive to to accumulate capital, right? So, um, we get, maybe, I don't know, we'll, we'll think about that later, okay? So, uh, but for now, you know, you're gonna, this, this is what we're gonna get in CRRA world, all right? Now, the, the other thing which I also note in the lecture slides is, um, you know, for the steady state stuff, okay, so here I just assume CRA straight, straight out of the gate. You know, the other thing you can assume is basically that epsilon u, that's a u, of c, uh, so let's say limit as c goes to infinity, I'll, I'll write this out in the proper way, is equal to some, you know, limiting value, well-defined limiting value, okay? So in that case, um, I remember this, this is actually epsilon like u prime, but sometimes they drop the prime. Uh, so in that case, you know, it, everything works out still, okay? It's just sort of like continuity in the limit or whatever. So so instead of theta, we'd have the, whatever the limiting value of that elasticity is for a more general type of utility function. And, it, and the dynamics will be different depending on what utility function is, but as, you know, as long as you converge to whatever epsilon star, then it's gonna be, you know, that's just gonna go in here as the determinant of the steady state value. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that that's that's sort of like how to think about uh, the sort of what, what happens when you have long-run growth. Nothing really breaks down. I mean, you get some extra terms, right? And, and that's, that's pretty much it, okay? And then, uh, the wage, the wage, the wage, the wage. Um, let's try it, okay. Uh, so we, we also should probably, since we're doing factor prices, think about the wage, okay? Uh, so here the wage is gonna be F sub L, K, A, L, all right? Um, how do I prove this? So so this the wage is always trickier, okay? But you can remember the way we proved the wage last time was we used that, that other property of homogeneous functions, which is that like F, is equal to k times f sub k plus l times f sub l, right? That's that's another property that we have is that you it's like linear and it's marginal somehow, okay? Because it's sort of CRS ish, okay? Um, uh, so that um, is how we because because f l uh, we don't really know how to work with it because of the way we normalize, but if we can sub in f l with f's and f k's. We know how to work with those. And that's why that's why we're able to kind of salvage things. All right. So um right, so so the uh the property that we're using is this. Okay. All right, we're using that. Um Okay, so now we want to be a little careful here uh, because we've got we've got we're going to get an extra a flying around. That's basically the issue because we're going to um, 
well, we're going to divide this whole equation, okay, by AL, which is going to be fine for the left-hand side. Uh, so on the left-hand side, when we divide by AL, we're going to get F of K over AL comma 1, which is just F of K tilde, right? That's Y tilde is, is Y over AL, okay? We're going to get... Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm here we're gonna get K tilde, right? So when we divide on the right-hand side, K over AL is K tilde, right? This, remember, is F prime of K tilde. F sub K is, is we just proved it. Um, here, here, where am I? There we go, uh, where do we show it? Basically, yeah, F sub K, this thing is just equal to F prime of K tilde. That's that's what we did before. Okay, and then plus what? Uh, we're, we divided by AL, so we're gonna get one over A times that, and let's just leave the FL thing alone for now. Okay, so that's um, that's our equation. And, and it, so it's, it's nice, it just has that extra A term, okay, floating around. Okay, so, if we if we plug that in here, right? Well, what is FL from that right hand side equation? FL is going to be um, a times f of k minus k tilde f prime k tilde, right? So just solve solve that right hand equation for FL, okay? And we're going to get um, this. Okay, tilde, I want that to be a bracket. It's gonna be a bracket now, oh dear. All right, that's that's our W, okay? So you can see it's the same as before, we just have the extra A because it's like, I don't know, the, I mean, it makes sense that wages should be growing if consumption and everything else is growing, okay? Um, we would hope that that happens, okay? Um, and so that's what we get. Sometimes, Right, and so so you know in steady state, okay. So with this tilde normalization in steady state, the tilde stuff is going to converge to specific values, right? That's why we do the normalization is because the tilde is converged to numbers that we can talk about concretely. So that tilde stuff is going to converge to something, but then the a is just going to keep on growing forever. So that's why the wage grows. Sometimes we'll we'll define w tilde to be you know the normalized wage, okay, and then that indeed will be you know the standard form like this, right? So we want to, um, yeah, so we can, we can, we can also normalize the wage and then things kind of work out as they should, right? Okay, uh, so those are the factor prices, right? Um, the wage is always a little tricky, but it's doable, right? Um, okay, so then, uh, let's see, what do we got? Um, there's also, you can also, okay, the, 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 now the question is, okay, we've gotten steady state capital. What about steady state consumption? Well, there, there's a, a tildefied uh, capital investment equation that we have, right? Um, right so remember the, the standard capital investment equation looks like uh, K dot, right? F of K minus delta plus N K minus C. That's our our standard issue normalized capital equation. All right, um, but then we want to we want to tildeify this, right? So we, we started out with the aggregate one a long time ago. We normalized it by labor. Now we want to normalize it by technology too, right? So um, yeah, and remember we can't just divide by A, right? Because of the growth rates. So in the end, we're going to get this. Um, in the end, we're going to get an extra G and everything's going to be tildefied. Why is that? Um, because it's the same thing as when we did population, right? Everything was the same. It's, it's as if we had divided by L, but we had an additional plus N, effective depreciation. Here, it's the same thing. We divide by A, everything gets tildefied, but we get this effective depreciation. 
you know, the way to the way to go through and compute it, right, is just find the growth rate. Is going to be the growth rate. The growth rate of the tilde k is going to be the growth rate of the normalized k minus the growth rate of a, which is which is our g. That's our technological growth rate, right? And so when you do this and you plug in, you're going to get this. Right? You're just going to get you're just get the additional factor of g. K tilde will come through too, um, and then you're all set, right? So because remember this is if you multiply implies the k tilde through, you're going to get uh, k dot times k tilde over k minus g k tilde, which is k k tilde over, um, let me get this right, uh, k tilde over k is just one over a. That's just that, that gives you the additional normalization factor. So this is the original growth, uh, the original derivative over a. So what you would sort of naively do, just divide by a, plus a correction term, which is g k tilde, right? So that's, this one almost directly will imply that, that equation, right? So, but but in general, I mean, you know, after a while you'll be able to, I mean, the, the, you know, if you have a lot of practice, this will be a single step operation. We'd be like, oh, we're normalizing, we need to change the effective depreciation rate. So we just pop on a, a, another G, okay? If you're if you're in a time crunch, maybe you, if you want to be really careful, you can go through and derive it the old-fashioned way. That's cool too. Uh, but if you're in a time crunch, sometimes you know these are the types of shortcuts that you might want to use, right? So um, okay, so then that 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 actually gives us the the dynamics actually uh, of k tilde. But in in particular, we can when that's zero, that'll give us c tilde equals some function of k tilde, which is which is going to give us the other component of steady state. All right, so. Yeah, after that, everything everything is basically the same. Um, yeah, uh, you, I guess I didn't I didn't exactly one hundred percent derive the the c tilde dynamic equation. I just went straight for steady state. But you can do the same thing that we did here. I don't know. Do I do it in the notes? I might. Yeah, I do it in the notes um, and derive a, a, a true dynamic equation for c tilde. Okay, but I won't I won't go over that too much. You get another factor of g basically. That's it. Right. Um, okay. So, and then once you do that, it's just you know you have the same type of sub equations except with tildes. You can do everything we did with stability and all that, um, and you can you can also find steady state directly from that. Um, okay. Now the other th the only other thing I'll say about this is uh, there's there's always two approaches when you have long run growth. Okay. You can you can do things in um, Unnormalized. You can actually do things almost entirely unnormalized in, in the full aggregate if you want. Oh, that gets a little messy sometimes. You can do it. Um, you can do things in a, a per capita setting, which is basically what we did here, and then kind of ex post say, oh, well, we know that G, that A is growing at rate G, and what are the implications of that? Okay. Um, or you can do things right off from the beginning in fully normalized terms and tilde terms. Uh, and go from there. Okay, so, and 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 really, what that means is you need to think about the utility function. Okay, so then um, this is like fully normalized from the beginning. Okay, so that's that's the one we haven't talked about so much. So there, you need to think about your utility function. Okay, so the you know, utility function that we're, we're the utility functions that we're working with. Um, we're, we're, we're going to have to look at specifically CRRA type C utility function here because otherwise it's hard to say things. Gener this approach is hard to do in the most general setting, okay? But with CRRA, uh, what does it look like? It looks like this. So that's our CRA utility function, C, and I guess this should be of T. Okay, and then uh, e to the minus... So, so here I'm already plugging in for the fact that population is growing. That's why I have a, a row minus n effective discount right there. Okay. In general, it's L of t, but you can combine that in. Okay, so, so this is what we would have for, for the case of CRA. So now what we want to do is reformulate this in, in tilde terms. Okay, um, So we want to have a tilde basically in there where that c is. Right. So, so we know we're defining c tilde to be per capita C over A. 
I remember, I always recall that for these utility functions, we look at the per, we put the per capita util, per capita consumption in utility. Okay, we don't put aggregate consumption, we put per capita consumption in utility because each individual values the the uh, that per capita level of consumption, and then we multiply it by all. Right. Implicitly, we're also assuming that we're dividing aggregate consumption perfectly evenly amongst everyone, as is the case in the real world, of course. Um, but yeah, so interesting things happen if you don't do that, but then it gets just much more complicated, okay? And you're kind of seeing, you know, it's complicated. I, I tried to introduce a little bit of heterogeneity with the second homework problem where we have the workers and the capitalists, okay? So that's like a, that's like a pretty, uh, kind of, I don't know, you could call it Marxist setup um, in terms of how to think about the theory is that you've got capitalists and they just do their thing and then the workers can't own capital and they just work, okay? So it, it, you're assuming a rigid you know, division between those two classes, but then you can see what the implications are. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Okay, so that's that's one step towards heterogeneity, but even that complicates things a bit. So, um, all right, so, but you guys have seen Ayagari, I think, uh, with Danny. So you've seen a bit of this and you can see that Ayagari is, is when you have a distribution of assets and everything like that, things get complicated, right? So, um, okay, so we want to, get back to the utility function, we want to have a C tilde in there, okay? So now with CRA, you have you have you have basically two terms. You have your C to the one minus theta term, and you have your minus one term. Now you can just ignore the minus one term, frankly, because it's just a constant, right? It's a constant minus one over one minus theta. If you separate it out, you can separate the integrals too, because the integrals are linear, and you're going to get I don't know minus one over one minus theta. <clears throat> divided by rho minus n or something like that. Okay, so it's going to come out just as a complete constant, right? So you, you if you want, this is going to be equal to, um, you know, this just first part of the utility term uh, times the appropriate exponential dt, and then minus, you know, like 1 over 1 minus theta times uh, 1 over rho minus n. Okay, if you if you do the integral, you get you divide by uh, rho minus n or minus rho, rho minus n, um, evaluated from zero to infinity. At zero, it's one. At infinity, it's zero. And you're just going to get um, this basically. That's a minus sign. It's a huge minus sign. I don't know what happened. It's not an m dash or anything like that. It's just a standard issue minus sign. Okay. Um, all right. So then uh, that yeah. So it's a constant. You can ignore it if you want. And, and, and that's convenient because then we don't have to worry about, you know, when you take a derivative, it disappears. So that as, as far as we're concerned, it doesn't matter. Right? That's, the, that's the general property of the way we approach utility functions, right? So now here, if you think about this normalization, C tilde equals C over A, that also means that C equals A times C tilde, right? So that's, that's what we're gonna plug in and then we'll get something nice, All right? So here, Integral from zero to infinity of uh, a c tilde, okay. And once we do this, then things are going to work out nicely because, well, first of all, um, it's a power function, right? The CRA is a power function at its core, uh, and so it'll it'll multiplicative factors we can shift around, right? Um, okay, so what we're gonna and and the other thing we know is that a is growing exponentially, right? So a a of t is you know a zero times e to the g t. So a a itself is an exponential. When we take it to a power such as one minus theta, it's still exponential, right? So a to the one minus theta is going to be growing exponentially um, at rate g times one minus theta, right? That's that's a Generate. That's the power rule, basically, that we did for growth rates before. Okay, um, and let's say so let's let's just assume that the initial level of technology is one. That's just we do the same thing with population, so it, we don't have an a zero floating around. Okay, um, a zero is one. Okay, so then um, so that's cool because that's gonna we're, we're gonna be able to factor this a through and combine it into our exponential. And it'll it'll create a new effective discount rate. Okay, so this is then going to look like oops, um, c tilde to the one minus theta over one minus theta. Okay, and I guess 
we still have, you know, minus this constant term, which I'm just going to call, you know, z, right? Um, which is it, we're ignoring it. Okay, so uh, let me see tilde, and they're going to have this exponential. If you combine it all through, you, you're going to get a, a an e to the g times one minus theta. But there's a minus on this exponential, so we're actually going to subtract it, just in the same way that we subtract n. Okay, so that's very I'll write it one minus theta times g, t dt minus z friend. Okay, um, so that's what we're going to get now. Our new effective discount rate is this rho minus n minus one minus theta g. Okay, and then in here, I mean, in here it's basically the same u of c looking thing, right? This, you know, if, if u of c was, is, is, you know, one minus theta, uh, you know, c to the one minus theta of rho minus theta, it's the same function, right? So when we go through all the algebra with Hamiltonian optimization, it's going to look exactly the same. All right. So this is like, u, this is just u of c tilde now. Okay. Um, and then, so we have uh, uh, c tilde, right? Which is basically the same utility function, a new effective discount rate. The other thing you can see is that, uh, when theta equals one, which is when utility is logarithmic, this uh, that g term uh, disappears in the effective discount rate. Because if you think about, okay, so here we did it in you know fully general CRA land. If we had done it in logs, we'd have at some point had log of a times c tilde. Well, the log of a is going to split out additively. And hence the, the, the integral is going to just totally split off and become part of z as some constant, which is not a function of any of our consumption choices. Right? The, the, at, at this point here, we would have had log of a c tilde. The log of a splits out. We can integrate that whole exponential, and it just come, it just is a complete constant with regards to any of our consumption choices, c tilde. Right? So... And, and so in that case, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect, it wouldn't get combined into the exponential. It would come off as an additive term. Okay, that's just one of those funny things where it, it, it's important, but then in the, as, it, in the limit as you hit log, it, it just changes its nature a little bit and becomes an additively separable thing, and then it's a little simpler. But but it's it's reflected here, right? When theta is one, this this thing disappears. So it, it's all continuous. It all, it all works. It's not some discontinuity in the limit. It's just... The derivation is slightly different if you're in true log. Okay, um, yeah. So, okay. So, and then from there, it's just you know, let, you know, call this rho tilde. Okay, put tildes in everything. Basically, instead of rho minus n, we're going to have rho minus n minus one minus theta g, which is rho tilde now, and everything is the same in terms of like that derivation. And then at the end, you're, you'll get. You know, dynamic equations to get an Euler equation, and you'll have your resource constraints that'll give you how you know how are we moving around in CK space. Okay, so you'll get that. You can draw a phase diagram. Everything, all of it is it's qualitatively exactly the same. Okay, so that, but the the fundamental choice though is just do you normalize beforehand, do things you know reformulate the utility function, uh, and then solve in a relatively straightforward manner, or do you not normalize and then normalize ex post after you've done the optimization. And so either one works, okay? Um, the only the only cost price you have to pay for normalizing beforehand is they actually do need to assume CRA, but that's pretty standard um, in our setting anyway, so that should be fine, okay? Um, yeah, in general, uh, the, the property of utility functions that you have to assume is called homothetic it is homothetic or it exhibits homotheticity. Uh, I prefer to say the first word because the second word is a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, so if your utility is homothetic, um, it, it basically means that it's CRA-like, okay? Uh, it, it's, and, I, and actually I think, now that I think about it, I think they're equivalent or in, 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 in most senses, but it just means that like when you, uh, when your income goes homoth homothetic in general just means that when your income goes up that like you're not gonna tilt your 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 the fraction that you're spending on the different types of goods right so it means that um and in this case it, it means that your your marginal utility is is a, a power function okay so but but i think in general like in a in a multi-good setting 
then it means that you're you know if you get more income you kind of just consume proportionately more of both goods a and b you don't say like oh i'm rich now i'm gonna i'm gonna stop eating ramen noodles because who wants to do that you're gonna you're gonna continue consuming ramen noodles and not do and whatever all the way out to infinity even if you're jeff bezos right so um yeah uh it kind of is that yeah let's see so it's home well the, so the it's era the margin utility it's it's is homogeneous degree theta maybe it might be equivalent yeah it might be equivalent to some kind of homogeneity perhaps uh yeah but you might you might be right there, there's some something may homo be homogeneous degree one I, that, that I think the margin utility is is like hom homogeneous but of, of any degree um but maybe yeah there's probably some way you can you can yeah I mean just sort of the proportionality scaling yeah there, there's a there's a scale invariance thing going on there yeah um okay so then uh all right so that that's that's just a little spiel about you know how you normalize sort of up to you but uh both ways usually will work okay um Okay, so then, yeah, I mean, uh, that's sort of like all I wanted to talk about with regards to, to Ramsey, okay? Um, so, uh, and then in terms of, you know, we, we went through the, the what happens in sub-changes, you can do the phase diagrams and all that fun stuff. Um, and then we, we haven't explicitly gone through multivariable optimization, but it's just, you know, you just add it on. If you got another state, you add it onto your Hamiltonian with a new different multiplier, so mu one and mu two or whatever. Uh, you add a new state evolution equation, so you're going to have your first order condition. You're going to have a state evolution from mu one, a state evolution from mu two, and then it's just like magically it works. Uh, you got constraints of the Lagrange variety. Just add those on; they'll also work. Everything is compatible. Okay. Um, you have multiple choice variables. You just have multiple force order conditions for each of those separately, okay? So so it all sort of works together nicely, all right? And uh, I guess, well, you guys, you guys have, uh, you're, you're on the homework in the first question, you're choosing labor. So you, you, you're you seeing, you, know, you have an additional choice variable. Um, you get another first order condition out of that, okay? Uh, so that's a static, it's, it's well, it's not, it's not static, but, it may end up being static potentially uh, in the sense of like you're, you're only thinking about things today. Okay. Um, and then I guess, uh, you know, for, for that one, you know, you have, uh, you do have bounds at zero and one, or you can't work less than zero or more than one. Um, and so you could put in inequality constraints at zero and one and have Lagrange multipliers tracking those. Oftentimes, you can just not and uh, hope for the best, right? So like, you know, in, in, in the case of this problem, right? Uh, you, you know, it, 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 you know, and not a conditions are gonna keep you from hitting constraints like that. And so that's when you can just sort of not do the Lagrange multiplier because you don't need it. You would never rationally choose that. Going greater, um, I think working more than one that should work because your leisure would go to zero. Um, uh, working less than, you, you might, on the other end, sometimes you, you may need a constraint, but but oft, it, oftentimes you don't need to actually worry about those. You can just sort of solve it and, get, and verify ex post that things work out, okay? Um, so don't, it's not like every time you have a, a constraint of that variety, you have to have this Lagrange multiplier flying around because oftentimes they will be non-binding um, and it's just easier to start out with without having that ex that constraint explicitly encoded, right? So if, if the constraint's non-binding, that the Lagrange multiplier will end up being zero because the, the constraint equation is, is positive, uh, sort of a complementary or slackness thing. So if the constraint's not binding and you kind of know it's not gonna be binding or you, you suspect it's not gonna be binding, just don't put it in, guess, and, and verify at the end that, it, that the constraint holds, but just don't put it in because it's gonna complicate your life, okay? So um, yeah. Okay, so then, uh, yeah, so that, that's that's it. That's um, that's optimization. Uh, now, uh, I guess we're going to turn a little bit of a page here in the course. 
Um, so there's kind of two things I want to keep on the horizon. Uh, so, so one in terms of sort of the uh, the types of say models that we're going to be thinking about. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit more into an endogenous growth direction. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna leave behind uh, exogenous growth in A. I mean, we're going to have growth in A, but we're not going to have it just, you know, G, that's it. That's the world. We're going to endogenize it. Okay. So um, there's kind of multiple steps. There's the semi, what's called semi-endogenous. Okay. Which is, uh, it's like kind of de the, the growth depends on what has happened in the past, but it's not like a choice by anyone. Okay. Which is why it's called semi-endogenous. And then there's fully endogenous where it's like, Growth, well, not only does it depend on what happens in the past, but it is the product of choices made by, say, firms that are deciding to invest in R&D to generate new and better products, hopefully. Um, and that is informed by their incentives, like how much profit they expect to get, and things like that. So it's a fully endogenous setting where you, where you get these predictions about growth in A, right? So um, that's, that's, that's in terms of the content and the models that we're looking at, where we're, we're headed, right? Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, I do want to um, go a little bit into computation, all right? So I'm going to have you guys doing some computing of things. Um, and so there, uh, I was thinking about starting it today, but I don't think I have time. So actually, I'm going to, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll have you guys just sort of like get things installed so that next time. You don't actually have to install things. I'll talk about that in a second. But but the idea is we're gonna when we're computing stuff, you know, you did value function stuff with Danny, right? I think you mentioned that. Okay. Um, so, you know, I guess what we want to do is think about okay, what about continuous time, right? So with with Ramsey, for instance, computing those uh, paths and phase space, uh, how to do that? Okay. It's actually a trick because it's unstable. It's not friendly to the, to the computer. But if you reverse time than it is because it turns out that if things are stable going forward in time if you go backward in time they're stable so they're unstable going forward if you go backward then they become stable which is cool um so so that'll be a, a little trick and method that we can use to compute this stable arm and everything like that uh and the fully not just linearized but the whole thing um and then we can also do sort of value continuous time value functions and stuff like that okay um actually you know i haven't done recursive value functions in continuous time what am I thinking? Um, we can compute stuff still, but um, maybe I should I should talk about that a little bit because it's actually kind of useful. Um, yeah, I mean we're we're almost halfway through the term, aren't we? So yeah, I, I, maybe I should talk about that. Maybe I'll do it combined somehow with with the computational part because you guys have seen it's similar to, to discrete time value function stuff. It's very similar. Um, but the, the, there's some minor differences, okay? So, uh, but we can do that too in, in the computational space, just looking at continuous time. Um, okay, and then in terms, yeah, so, so that's the goals in terms of like what we're, what we're gonna compute, just how to do it. Um, and then in terms of the tools, I mean, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have you do Python because I think it's better. Uh, that's not everyone's opinion, but, I, and also I think it's, it'd be useful and it's not too much different from MATLAB, honestly zero versus one indexing that's it's more or less it um but it can be more powerful uh so um the, the good thing is that there you don't have to install it if you don't want you can just go there's like web-based versions you can do basically everything that we're gonna want to do uh we're not going to be doing stuff that requires massive computers or anything like that so it's just it's relatively simple um so you can you like uh there's these like hosted python environments so the one one that's actually pretty good that's gotten better recently is Kaggle. If you search for Kaggle kernels, I'll put like a, I'll post something on this. If you search for Kaggle kernels, it's like Kaggle is like some programming competition website or something, but they have these hosted kernels where you can uh, just get a, just a Python environment, just boot it up and, and go there. Um, yeah, I'll post a little bit, a little document on this, I guess, uh, just sort of links. But um, it, yeah, and then you can install it on your computer. It, it should work fine there too. Um, like there's this Anaconda Conda environment uh, that, that makes things pretty simple where you can just use regular pure Python. Um, so yeah, so I would like just check that out. If you, if you want to go the route of installing on your own computer, then install it and let me know if, 
it works uh, or if it doesn't work. Um, or if you want to just use uh, the hosted ones, that works. That's fine too. Um, there's Kaggle and uh, I think Microsoft Azure has it too. And that somehow is can be done through Pit. Um, it's, it's pretty good too. I think Kaggle is a little better, but um, you can do that too. All right, so uh, I just sort of install that, just see like if it works and and, um, and and let me know if it doesn't, okay? And help each other out too, all right? So, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk more about it next time, okay? And then that's it. Uh, I'll see you, uh, if you want, at, at uh, Office Hours tonight. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll see you on Tuesday.